a rising threat to U.S. troops in Iraq, and how Iraqi Christians are coping now that ISIS has been defeated. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holton here. I'm back still in one of my favorite places in the world, out here at the pond, and just kicking back, enjoying my vacation. But I'm still working hard for you, and you ought to be very grateful about that, because look at this. I could be fishing right now, even though I don't like fishing. Anyway, let's talk about Iraq. Well, ISIS is mostly dead in Syria, and as I've been saying for a long time, that's only the beginning of the troubles in that region. Iran has big designs on every inch of land between Tehran and Beirut, Lebanon. And right now, about the only things standing in the way of those aspirations are Israel and the United States of America. Rising tensions between the United States and Iran are, are playing out in the Middle East, with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo making a surprise visit to Baghdad last week. This happened after U.S. intelligence showed an increased threat from Iran on U.S. forces in the Middle East, and in Iraq, that takes the form of the Hashishabi, which are Iranian-backed Shiite militias who are now pointing rockets at U.S. bases uh, in Iraq. So Pompeo showed up with a firm message for Iraq's top brass. They need to keep those militias in check because they're trying to expand their power around Iraq, and they now form part of its security apparatus. And if not, the U.S. is not going to hesitate to put some real hurt on those militias, which will certainly set everybody's hair on fire in Baghdad. As tensions between Washington and Tehran are increasing, Iraq is kind of caught between the two, not wanting to give up all the funding it still receives from the U.S. and its allies, but also not wanting to anger its neighbor Iran, who's got its fingers in the highest levels of the Iraqi government. Now, the Hashishabi fought alongside the U.S. and Iraqi forces in the fight against ISIS. But they've always been controlled by Tehran. In fact, the head of their Quds Force, Major General Qasem Soleimani, was in Iraq when I was there one time and was visiting the Hashishabi units near Mosul. But just like we fought against ISIS and so did the Russians and the forces of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, that doesn't mean we have much else in common with these people. In fact, the Hashishabi are now engaged in an operation along the Iraqi border alongside Syria, uh, with Syrian forces from Assad, to try to root out any remaining elements of ISIS. When Mike Pompeo left Baghdad, he had this to say on the plane after taking off. Well, uh... As you know, we just took off out of Baghdad. I had uh, two meetings I was with Ambassador Satterfield, uh, George A., uh, Joey Hood, and Lieutenant General Camarena. We met with, uh, first with uh, Prime Minister, uh, and then with President Saleh. In each meeting, we went through a number of things. First of all, we talked to them about uh, the importance of Iraq ensuring that it's able to adequately protect uh, Americans and their country. They both provided assurances that they understood that was their responsibility. We wanted to let them know about the increased threat stream that we had seen and give them a little bit more background on that so they would have enough information that they could uh, ensure that they were doing all that they could to provide protection for our team. They understood, too, it's important for their country. Uh, we don't want anyone interfering in the country, certainly not by attacking another nation inside of Iraq. Uh, and we're, there was complete agreement across that. We also I talked about some of the broader issues. We talked about the fact that there's still work to do uh, to uh, complete the destruction of ISIS. Uh, there are still pockets of ISIS inside of Iraq. We talked about how we will jointly work to keep Iraqi safe by going after those forces with, um, with their team. Uh, and then finally, we talked about some of the things that Iraq needs to do uh, to develop its own infrastructure, some of the uh, electric electricity need demands that they have, some of the needs that they'll have for, for water in the south and summer, although it's been a rainy year for them. Uh, they're still going to have enormous water demand in the Basra uh, uh, as the summer approaches. Uh, and then also for crude oil and for natural gas. We talked about how uh, we can help them build up the infrastructure that they need. So it was a productive set of meetings. Uh, we wanted to go there to demonstrate to, uh, to our team that Iraq is an important place for us. And the Secretary of State wanted to be there to make sure uh, our team understood uh, that this was a place that we were going to continue to stay to do our work to help build out a free independent sovereign Iraq. Now look, the Hashishabi aren't just a threat to the U.S. troops in Iraq because they're uh, because of their connection to Iran, 
they really destabilize and threaten the whole region. When I visited northern Iraq in February, I went and spoke with some of the Christian groups and Kurdish political parties who are being threatened by Iran's advances. It's hard to even begin to describe all the different competing interests that are now sort of struggling to control the area in what we would call the Nineveh Plain, that's uh, north and central Iraq, because now that ISIS has been driven out, there's been a massive sort of power vacuum created. And one of the groups that is really hoping to be able to live there in peace are the Christians, those few that are left that weren't driven out or killed by ISIS. Now, those Christian groups have now formed like 10 different political parties. And among them, they have started what you would call like a National Guard or uh, militia groups. There's about 4,000 members of those groups. This is one of them here. And he's guarding the headquarters of one of those political parties that essentially is called the Patriotic Union Party of Mesopotamia. We're going to go meet the president of that party now. So in 2004, after Saddam's regime uh, fell down, so the situation of uh, Christians became to be worse and worse. So yeah, Al-Qaeda and the other terrorists, they were fighting and uh, make, make uh, uh, Christians uh, leave their houses. I remember in Baghdad there were uh, 700, 750,000 Christians, but now there are only about uh, 70,000 Christians in Baghdad because they all left because of uh, terrorists. So I also spent one day driving out near the Iranian border to visit a Kurdish political party that's actually been attacked by Iran in the recent past. On September 8th, 2018, at 1045 in the morning, there was a leaders meeting going on in this compound for the KDPI, that's the Kurdish Democratic Party of Iran. And seven missiles fired from Iran came and landed, two of them in this compound, killing 14 people and wounding more than 50. Nindy Bells, senior editor at World Magazine, author of They Say We Are Infidels, on the run from ISIS with persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Okay, so tell me about persecuted Christians in the Middle East. What, what's your two-minute you know, explanation? Yeah. Well, you know, Iraq is a great place to look because when I first started covering the U.S.-led war in Iraq, um, this country had about a million Christians. And right now, a uh, church leader told me yesterday they're under 200,000. And so the decline has been dramatic here. And it's dramatic when you think about what these populations have been through, that they've been here since the beginning of Christianity. They've survived the Mongols. They've survived the Persians. They've survived the rise of Islam. And yet somehow, a decade after a U.S.-led war, they are on the verge of extinction. What do you think were the biggest mistakes the United States made that sort of led, you know, maybe didn't cause it, but certainly right. didn't, didn't stop it? Well, I think that we came in with a, with a simple, simplified or simplistic understanding of the territory, and we simply didn't understand the diversity here, that Iraq is not just a country of Sunni and Shiite Muslims, but that it's also a country of Turkmans, of Kurds, of Shabaks, and of Christians, even a variety of Christians who are here, of evangelicals and Chaldeans and Assyrians, um, and then Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholics. We didn't understand the diversity, which is ironic when you think about the diversity in the United States. So we came in with simplified solutions. We allowed vacuums to be created in areas where these minorities, in particular the Christians, were very vulnerable. And we did that at a time when radical Islam was going after Christian believers. And it was only a matter of time before we would see the rise of ISIS and we'd, we would see them swoop in and, and actually take over the com these communities the way that they did starting in 2014. So what, what could America do now to uh, reverse this, this trend? I have a hard time answering that question because, I, I, I mean, we're five years out. We're almost five years out from the coming of ISIS. These communities have been holding on without much support. They have not had the support from the Iraqi government that they should have. They have not had the support from 
um, people that they would expect to have it from, people in the West, which would include the United States. I think that, um, and, and you know, it's remarkable. The, the thing that keeps me coming back here is to see how they've supported themselves and how they have found ways. They have raised funds from their expat communities, from other churches, to support themselves through this time. It's a remarkable story. And I also think that um, there's so much for us to learn from that. We in the West have a lot to learn from the resilience of these ancient communities here. And so I think there's a, there's a mutual benefit that can happen. It's not just simply what do we need to do, how much money do we need to spend, how much blood and treasure do Americans have to spend in the Middle East. I, I think those are the wrong questions. I think it's a matter of how we learn and how we benefit when we partner with them and, and come in and find ways to, to help them survive. In the midst of the tragedy that's kind of slow motion unfolded over the last five years when, among Christians in Iraq, they have actually reached out to many of the IDPs and refugees that have come into their country right. and helped them. Right. So tell me about that. Um, there's a church not far from here. Uh, they turned their offices into apartments for displaced people. They, um, they partnered with a church in Indiana and um, rented out apartments in a new high-rise apartment building so that they could house up to about 80 families in that building. This, this is not a big church doing big work. And I've seen that over and over, that you have these small um, communities that are themselves under threat, and yet they still find ways to take in those who've actually lost their homes, who've lost family members, who have people who've perhaps been captured by ISIS, they take them in and they find housing for them and, and necessities. So I know about these ancient churches, the Syriac and the, the uh, Chaldean and, and the uh, Aramaic-speaking churches here, that sort of thing. Tell me about the evangelical Christian community in Iraq. Yeah. The evangelical churches in Iraq are a tiny community, but I think because they are not simply drawing on historic tradition, they're drawing on gospel power. They really are preaching the gospel. They're reaching out to across all population groups here. Um, you will see if you go to a service in one of their churches, you will see Muslims sitting perhaps on the front row. You'll see Kurds. You will see members of all different kinds of groups here. And so for that reason, they have a tremendous influence and reach and power. Um, some of them have roots in some of the older, there are Presbyterian churches that date back more than a century here. Those, um, one of them survives. At one time, there were three of them. And out of those churches has grown a real evangelical witness. And they continue to, they have some support from the West, um, but they continue to grow in spite of all the obstacles. They don't have the historic affiliations and the denominational affiliations here that we would see among those Syriac groups or Chaldean groups. And so they struggle in that sense. And there has been tension among all of those churches. But we would find that in the West, too, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, we would, for sure. Now, the um, what happens to Christians in Iraq, if uh, what's at stake if Kurdistan is not nurtured and supported, um, if if Turkey is allowed to sweep in, or you know if if America pulls out precipitously and, and leaves kind of another power vacuum here, what's at stake for Christians in? Without political protections, without um, without having some protections for the freedom to worship and to believe as they feel called to, I, I fear that we are just buying time for these groups. And I think that what's at stake for us to realize is that these are some of the oldest churches in the world. Um, there are churches here that go back to the second and third century. You had monasteries here that were preserving scripture that we in the West have all benefited from. And so it's, it's these current communities that are at stake, but what they represent is a whole vast treasury of Christianity as it moved out from, um, from Jerusalem, let's say. 
It moved west, but it also moved east. And this is the first place that it came and where it really took root here. And that whole heritage is at rest. And if we abandon Kurdistan. Right. I, I believe that what we see here, what we have seen, this is the region where Christians fled to at the point of a gun. When they were faced with a choice of converting or being killed, they fled north. They fled to Kurdistan because Kurdistan has demonstrated a level of political and economic freedom that has been unseen in the rest of the country. And um, expanding those kinds of freedoms and expanding the security that it takes so that it's not security that is Iranian-backed or Turkish-backed, but it is, it is Iraqi security, it is homegrown security that they can trust and rely on. That's what it's going to take to restore these communities. Well, that's all I have for today, folks. Thanks for watching. Imagine having to make a 20-minute TV show every day of the week. Well, that's how hard I'm working to bring you this content. And judging by our numbers, people are really liking it. Well, I'm doing all that for you, and the least you can do in return is just like and share the podcast with your friends. I've got some great trips planned coming up over the next couple of months. You're going to really like it, so I hope you'll stick around. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Hot Zone. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.